big slides, the first one, yeah. And then we want to try to reverse it, so you can see switch like this goes up here and switch here. Yeah. And switch whatever is bigger. That one will be. Yeah, yeah, should be fine.
Okay, welcome everyone. After this, uh, the, the break, the next session, we're gonna kick start with uh, Nathaniel Lim from the University of British Columbia from Canada, talking about reproducibility or the lack thereof uh, in the CMAP datasets. Nathaniel, please welcome to the stage. All right. Very good. Okay. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, before I start, I would like to thank um, the organizers, and in particular, the Kamda community for actually giving me the opportunity to share my work with you today. Um, I also like to thank um, the talk abstract reviewers and colleagues who actually visited my poster yesterday for their comments and feedback. They were definitely very helpful. So, <clears throat> Today I'll be talking about evaluating the connectivity maps um, in terms of the reproducibility in drug repositioning. So as some of you all may be aware, um, the whole connectivity map project was created um, in part to try to enable users to computationally perform drug repurposing or mode of action studies. And um, over here, I'm showing you a diagram uh, that's lifted from the very first CMAP paper that was published almost a decade ago. Um, so as you can see here, um, outside of the connectivity, uh, connectivity map framework, a, a user may have a hit list of genes or what is called as signatures in CMAP parlance of, um, in this case, um, a group of genes that are up-regulated and down-regulated for a study of interest. So what the user will do is to query connectivity map with this signature. Now, connectivity map consists of two components. One is this huge database of profiles uh, in which different cell lines are put up with different compounds at different dosages and at different, uh, for, different, di for different durations. And a second component to CMAP, or connectivity map, is the gene set enrichment alg algorithm. So what CMAP does basically is to take this signature and compare it against all the profiles and looking for whichever um, profile that is most similar or most enriched to, um, to, the, to the signature, sorry. So what happens after that is that it'll give a ranking of the different compounds, ranking like the compound that is most strongly and rich or most similar to that of the query, and uh, all the way down to that which is less and rich or less similar. So today, um, there are two versions of connectivity map. The first one was released more than a decade ago, and for the purpose of our analysis, we use what is known as Build02, and I'm referring to that as CMAP1. And as you can see, it is very widely used, or at least widely cited, um, at least 3,000 citations uh, in Google Scholar. Now, CMAP2, uh, which, I'm, which, which I call CMAP2, is what today is known as the Lynx L1000 dataset, was published two years ago, and as we can see, currently it has about 300 citations. So why, what brought us um, to be interested in this whole question of reproducibility is that in our lab, through our collaborations, we actually use connectivity map to look for compounds of interest for further study. Now what we discovered though is that the recommendations given by one CMAP is very much different from the recommendations given by the other. So this raises some questions as to, are the two CMAPs really as similar as we think they should be, or they are, or whether one of the CMAPs recommendations might be false altogether? So we started off by asking, has anybody actually compared between the two CMAPs? So the first thing we look at is the, the paper that actually announced CMAP2, the Link's paper, and we saw that the original authors did not perform any evaluation comparing CMAP1 to CMAP2 in terms of compound recommendation or in terms of the similarity of the underlying data. So we went through uh, literature and we found that there are some attempts uh, by different groups um, where they have 
to some limited extent compared between both CMAPs. Um, however, the main focus of their papers was not really to compare between the two CMAPs, but to figure out uh, how to use one of them for their own purposes. So the comparisons were either anecdotal or it could be qualitative in nature, or there were some comparisons we felt that could be a lot fairer. So that's why we started entering this whole process of doing a formal evaluation between the two CMAPs. So in terms of our evaluation, we raised three major questions. The first one is, are the two CMAPs, um, the recommendations from both of them consistent? And as you can tell from my title, that is not really true. So the next thing we then tried to figure out is what is actually causing this inconsistency. And the third question that we asked, which I believe is of the greatest interest to users of CMAP, would be which one is better or the one we can trust more. So by, <clears throat> sorry. So now we try to address the first question as to which, uh, whether the recommendations are reproducible. So for this, we, you, we, which we, sorry, we use a, a series of quantitative tests to test this question. And I would like to highlight one thing is that we use the web tools that are provided exclusively by the CMAP or the Lynx team to emulate uh, usage by regular users. So for the first question, one of the tests could be considered as a retrieval assessment. So say you have a signature, uh, we have a signature that is derived from the data from CMAP1. In this case, let's say it's cisplatin, for example. And if we take that signature and query CMAP2, making the assumption that the data between CMAP1 and CMAP2 are very similar, we would expect that CMAP2 would say its own cisplatin profile is very similar to that of CMAP1's cisplatin, and it will rank cisplatin right on the top, saying that it's the most relevant or the most similar <coughs> drug. Now, if that is not the case, then clearly there is some differences between uh, in, inside the data. So at the same time, um, as a positive control, uh, we also take um, the pre-calculated pre rankings of the same drugs that we tested, but those were actually generated by querying CMAP2 that was done by the Lynx team already um, <clears throat> as the positive control. So I also like to mention that we also um, have certain requirements for the CMAP1 signatures. Specifically, we had to ensure that the signatures uh, were derived from cell lines, drugs that are found exactly in CMAP2, and we control the time point so that is six hours because that's the most common uh, time point that's shared between the two uh, data sets. And in cases where there were multiple dosages for this combination, we took the strongest dose. So over here, I'm showing the results of the positive control. What you can see on the left is a histogram. On the x-axis is the retrieval rank. So in other words, for, for every single compound that is part of this histogram, we want it to be ranked closer to zero because the first rank, rank one, would mean that it's retrieved at the highest point. The y axis is number of um, signatures that are used, and the dotted gray line here indicates the top 10% of compounds on the 68th rank. We use this as it's an arbitrary threshold to say, okay, the correct compound was retrieved. Here I'm showing the CDF representation of the same data, and we can see that 83% of the time, um, the correct compound was retrieved in the top 10%, or half of the time it is ranked first. So this positive, the positive control here, this result here shows that this is the best possible performance if we repeat the whole experiment but using CMAP1, to, uh, CMAP1 signatures to query CMAP2. And it will only be able to replicate this kind of a result if the data is similar. Um, additionally, I'll also be talking about this 17% that did not make the mark uh, a little later. 
So here I'm, show, I'm plotting out the results for when we query CMAP2 using CMAP1 signatures, and it's in red. And we can see that only 17% of signatures managed to be correctly retrieved in the top 10, or just 1% is ranked first. <clears throat> so this is, uh, the results clearly is much lower than that of the positive control. And I also like to highlight the fact that considering that this is a retrieval assessment, this is the best case scenario for CMAP use. Now, we also like to acknowledge the fact that um, there are some CMAP1 signatures that we use, especially those of the highest concentrations, may not uh, exist in CMAP2's data. And that different, different drug concentrations may actually elicit different transcriptional response. So to address that, we repeat the whole experiment, but now we are using signatures where the dosage is found in both CMAPs. So this is actually a much better test, but one of the drawbacks is that we have much less signatures to work with. So <clears throat> within this scope, once again, with much less signatures, we see that the positive control has a very similar performance than that as I showed earlier. <clears throat> However, with CMAP1, um, we see a very similar thing coming up again. So just recall that the assumption is that if the data is the same between the two, the retrieval performance should be very similar to that of the positive control, which is not the case. Sorry. Though by ensuring that the dosages are the same definitely did help improve performance. As we can see here, now it's 40% 40 per, 40 of the time it's in the top 10% and 12% of the time it's ranked first. But still, it's much lower than that of the positive control. So with these results at this point, we can fairly well establish that CMAP2 has pretty limited performance in retrieving compounds when queried with um, CMAP1-derived signatures. So this, all right, <coughs> sorry, I forgot about this one. So now I'm, so recall the 17% earlier that I said that did not make the mark in the positive control. Here I'm showing two scatter plots. This is from the first histogram and this is from the second histogram. Either of them is pretty much the same. The red dotted line here indicates the top 10%. We, we can see that there's a fair number of compounds where CMAP2 has a hard time uh, retrieving it, and that's indicated on the right-hand side of the red line. And we can see that for these, whoa, for these compounds um, where CMAP2 has a hard time doing self-retrieval, CMAP2 also have a hard time retrieving them when querying with CMAP1, and that is shown above this red line. Now, the inverse is not necessarily true, where when CMAP1 is able, uh, sorry, CMAP2 is able to self-retrieve its own uh, signatures for those compounds, uh, it does not necessarily perform that well when CMAP1 uh, signatures are used to query CMAP2. So one key implication of this observation is that now for CMAP2 users in particular, they do have a means of assessing whether uh, the level of confidence they can assign to compounds that are recommended by CMAP2, especially when they are querying it with novel signatures where there is no way to determine whether the recommendations are sound or not, whether, because some people may use things like drug mode of action similarity and stuff like that. But one thing we can say for sure is that if CMAP2 has a hard time retrieving its own uh, retrieving compounds that um, ha have a hard time doing self-retrieval of certain compounds, it is, we can assign way less confidence when, it is, when those same compounds are being recommended. So move, moving on to another different test, still for the first question, it's a little different test. The idea is that, <clears throat> so when we were performing our literature search, um, and we, we actually found positive reports where their researchers, by using biological assays, tried to validate the recommendations made by either of the CMAPs, and they were fairly successful in that respect. So the idea of this test now 
is, let's say we can take one of these signatures, and maybe in the original paper they used that to query CMAP1, we take that signature and query CMAP2. Now, if both of the CMAPs are similar, we would expect that those same compounds that were already validated to be highly ranked or recommended by the counterpart CMAP. Now, if that's not true, then the recommendations are not reproducible. So this test is a little difficult for us to perform, partly because not all of the papers provide the original query signatures they use, or there are other complications to it. Regardless, we found three sets of signatures we could use from four different papers. Three of the papers used CMAP1, and one used CMAP2. And uh, in the interest of time, I'll be showing the results for Brum et al. and Ferguson et al. So from what we can see here on, in this table is that both CMAPs actually are unable to reproduce the results from the counterpart CMAP. And, and this is especially for the validated drugs here that, uh, that I've listed here on the table. So just as a reminder, the smaller the ranks, the higher that compound is being recommended. So we can see here, like in Brum et al., where CMAP1 has actually ranked these compounds in the top 20, but when we repeat the same experiment in CMAP2, they were ranked way, way beyond 100. Same thing with, for the reverse, when CMAP2 is actually being used originally in CMAP1, um, is the test we perform um, <coughs> using Ferguson et al. signature. So while these results are anecdotal, it does establish that the recommendations between the two CMAPs can be mutually um, irreproducible. So with this, we can start moving on to the second question, which is trying to find out what is the cause of this inconsistency. So what we have chosen to do is to focus on the data, partly because um, the enrichment algorithm that's used in both CMAPs are fundamentally the same. So we approached this through a few different angles. Uh, we decided to look at whether the differential expression uh, of the, the differential expression profiles of the same exact conditions is reproducible between the two CMAPs on, and also within each CMAP independently. At the same time, we also did um, the same experiment for, in terms of the gene expression levels in CMAP2, but in the interest of time, I won't be talking about it today. Now, I want to direct your attention to the first one in particular. The hypothesis is that if there is very poor agreement in the differential expression profile between the CMAPs, then it wouldn't be surprising if the earlier results where we see that CMAP2 has difficulty in recommending the right compounds using CMAP1 signatures. So, the first test <coughs> um, for this second question goes like this. So we're looking at the agreement or the correlation, the rank correlation of the differential expression profiles from CMAP1 comparing it against CMAP2 for the same condition. In other words, the profile needs to be derived but from the same cell line, treated with the same drug, at the same dosage for the same duration of time. So I show here an example of the scatter plot with a Spearman correlation of 0 0.45, which is actually the best performing one. So this is one element in this huge histogram of 109 profiles or conditions. And we can see on this histogram that the mean of the distribution is basically zero, which means that there's very limited agreement um, between both CMAPs in terms of differential expression. So now, if we go back to the original hypothesis that I just mentioned earlier, is there a relationship between agreement between the uh, data sets and the retrieval performance. And we see that, yes, to some extent, there is a relationship. Um, what I'm showing here on the x-axis is the cross data set agreement, so the distribution of zero uh, at the mean of zero that I showed earlier. And this is the retrieval ranking when we query CMAP2 with CMAP1 data. We see that there is a negative correlation here, and that's that 
that's reasonable because we, we want the rank closer to one. And when you have higher agreement between data sets, the likely is going to have rank one cases. So it would be a negative correlation. So we see that, yeah, um, agreement between data sets is predictive of um, retrieval performance. So the next thing we look at next is what about within data set agreements since we already seen between data set agreements. So the same thing is that we look at a number of different conditions and we had and there and for both CMAPs there are actually quite a few replicates for the same conditions which uh, I guess was mentioned yesterday in in one of the talks. And so we once again um, I seem to be repeating myself on this one. Every time when we perform the test, we try our best, or in almost all cases from here on, that they need to be from the same cell line, same drug, same dose, same time. And in this case, what I do is I take the pairwise correlation uh, between the replicates of the same condition, and I'm, take, I'm plotting the best performing correlation, and I'm plotting it out. And we see, even with the, the distribution, still centers around zero. So to put this distribution in perspective, what, commonly, what we commonly observe when we are doing correlations of differential expression replicates within a data set is actually around 0 0.9, as reported by MAQC. So what we are seeing here is a much, much lower agreement. So one natural question that, comes, that can come up here now is that so you've seen between data set agreement, you've seen within data set agreement, is there a relationship between the two? Short answer, yes. <coughs> Sorry. So on the x-axis, we are looking at the within data set agreement. This one's for CMAP1, this is for CMAP2, and this is cross data set agreement. So we're comparing CMAP1 versus CMAP2. Once again, we can see <coughs> there is some level of relationship between the two. Um, and the row values here, up here are the Spearman correlations. So, <coughs> with this, we can establish that if a condition is reproducible within one of the CMAPs, it would likely be reproducible between the CMAPs, and thus it will also likely have a better retrieval performance later on. So moving on a slightly different tangent. <coughs> Sorry about this. So far, all the results that I've shown is that the differential expression reproducibility in both CMAPs is low. So this kind of suggests that the differential expression signal that we are seeing may not be sufficiently strong or consistent enough to be picked up during rank correlation analysis. So we are thinking about, okay, could there be any factors that is actually causing this? And one of the things we decided to look at is compound concentration. So over here, I'm plotting the data for Vorinostat uh, from CMAP2 data. And here we can see that with increasing concentrations, within the data set, the agreement between the replicates tend to improve for both MCF7 and PC3 cell line. Now, if I plot the other two for triclostatin A and Wattmanin, we see a very similar trend. And in Wattmanin, we see something quite unexpected. So for PC3, there's this notable increase in within data set ag uh, agreement, and less so for MCF7. So what this suggests is that there may also be a cell type specific effect influencing within data set agreement. So all of this taken together suggests that the dosages used in CMAP2, especially those at the much lower dosages, may not be high enough to elicit a strong and or a consistent enough transcriptional response. And with that, we move on to the final question, <coughs> which is, which one is better? And I guess everybody's kind of waiting for this one, uh, hopefully. 
So to try to resolve this whole dilemma about which CMAP is better, we decided to resolve this by comparing them against an independent external CMAP-like data set generated by their Brew and colleagues. <clears throat> the idea is to use a three-way rank correlation between them um, of the differential expression profiles. Once again, making sure that the cell line time and compound is the same and exact or similar enough dosages. And with this, we have 12 compounds to work with. And with the exception of Vorinos, that, which has a relatively high Spearman correlation against all the data sets, for the remaining 11 compounds, the correlations were less than 0 0.2. The median is actually close to zero. So very unfortunately, um, we couldn't really figure out which data set is actually better because they were all mutually different. And with that, to conclude my talk, the first thing that we found out is that the, the compound recommendations for both CMAPs are mutually irreproducible. And this is very likely caused by the low data reproducibility between the two CMAPs. Also, we found that compounds that are not ranked highly by CMAP2 during self-retrieval is probably also not going to be able to rank the same compounds highly when CMAP2 is queried with CMAP1 signatures. We also found that reproducibility both between and within the CMAPs are very low. And we also see this chain of associations linking within CMAP differential expression agreement to between data set agreement to the retrieval performance. So they are, they are mutually predictive. The third thing is that we found that the two factors, both compound concentration and cell lines, are associated with the reproducibility of differential expression, especially within the data set. And when we consider that within the data set agreement as a proxy measure for the strength and consistency of the differential expression signal, our results demonstrate that number one, that drug dosages that are used in the CMAPs may not be in the correct range to elicit a strong or consistent enough cellular transcriptional response, or two, which is the fundamental assumption that all of us are making here, that by treating cells with a drug will elicit a strong or consistent transcriptional response may actually not hold true more often than we'd expect. And the fourth one, um, our attempt in identifying the better CMAP was unsuccessful. And taking into consideration the reported positive findings in literature, um, I guess we could say that the recommendations from both CMAPs at this point, we will say that they, are, they both might be real, they might be true, but they're just different. So what do we do with this now? So I, we do have a couple of recommendations moving forward. <clears throat> Up to this point, I've shown the results for retrie the retrieval assessment of CMAP2 in which we queried it with signatures of cell lines treated with drug compounds in a very standardized manner. When we consider the fact that <clears throat> the performance in this case is actually a best case scenario in which we can actually gauge the accuracy of the compound retrieval performance, it is actually quite concerning when CMAP is actually used uh, in, in very regular settings where you have, um, where, sorry, where the true or correct recommendations is unknown. And this is in particular when you have cases where use, users query CMAP <clears throat> with very novel signatures that are derived from cells that are actually not included in, in CMAP itself. So with this, we have four different recommendations. The first one is that we users should really strive to query CMAP using signatures that are derived from cells or cell lines within the CMAPs. The second one, uh, which is mainly for CMAP2 users, they actually have a benefit where they could reduce the false positives 
in the drug recommendations by filtering out, for, for, filtering out compounds where CMAP2 has a hard time uh, performing self-retrieval. Or alternative, alternatively, <coughs> the Lynx team could also consider further optimizing the query data set by filtering for the compounds where they are internally reproducible so the users don't have to do that to reduce false positives. Um, the third point is, so if people will ask me, okay, in this case, um, which CMAP would you recommend to use? I would say if you can use both. And if you query both of them and you have certain compounds that are jointly recommended by both CMAPs, then you, you could say that, okay, we'll prioritize testing those double hits probably would have give you a higher success. And the last one is that users should continue to experimentally validate the compounds that's recommended by both CMAPs. But more importantly, they should also consider testing some of the compounds that are not recommended by the CMAPs to gauge what the, the specificity of the recommendations are. And that marks the end of my presentation. Um, I'd like to thank my supervisor and co-author of a manuscript that we are almost about to submit soon um, for its active support and advice through this whole process. Uh, I'd like to thank Ogan and Jermon, uh, colleagues who actually raised the whole question about reproducibility of CMAP results to us. Uh, I'd like to thank the undergrads that were working with me, Aman, Kelvin, and Owen, for their help in data curation and fellow lab mates uh, from the Pafilidis lab for their continued support and feedback. Um, this work is supported by grants from the NIH, NSERC, and UBC for your PhD fellowship. And my travel here is made possible by various travel grants, including the ISMB CAMDA fellowship in partnership with the US FDA and CTR. So thank you very much for listening, and I shall now take questions from the floor. Uh, okay. Um, so, okay, so I already see that we have some questions. Great talk, by the way. Thanks for the great talk. So, um, your all analysis start from differential expression, and uh, that's a rather elusive concept. So, how did you define differential expression in this case? So, differential, yeah, okay, so for me, my working, de my working definition of differential expression is when you look at the changes of expression levels, when you compare a treatment group against that of a control group of samples. Now, for CMAP1 and CMAP2, that definition is a little bit variable. In CMAP1, what they use is they use a single sample from the treated group compared against to a single sample in a control group. In CMAP2, they take a group of treated samples comparing it against the median uh, of the population expression within a particular RNA plate. So you could argue that comparing between two might have issues, and that is not something I can easily resolve either. Yeah, but I mean, how do you summarize that? I mean, is it a binary decision and you take a binary list, or because I mean... Uh, no, it's a continuous. It's, it's on a continuous scale. And what is the continuous scale? It's a ratio between... Um, the treated group over the control group, and so it, and if and if you, so it, yeah, it's basically a ratio. Okay, but I mean, of course, I mean that's potentially highly unreliable. If one of the values is very small, then kind of the ratios can be very right. So dependent on that. <clears throat> so when in the case of CMAP one, which is log two transform, basically is constrained between negative sixteen to sixteen which is a huge range. Which is the scale, but I think in the CMAP1 data itself, it, it's really not that large. I think it's between, yeah, there we go. I mean, I, mean, I don't know I mean, if it fits within your work, but I mean, to me, it sounds like, I mean, it might be worthwhile thinking about kind of how you define differential expression, and I mean, especially if you want to rank things based on differential expression, then, kind of there would be different measures and I mean sort of somehow some of these estimates of uh, of fold change are more reliable than others and 
I, I don't know what would be a good way to do that, but I mean, that might be something we need to think. I mean, if we want to use this kind of resources and do these things based on differential expression. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree. And that's actually one of the difficulties when I was trying to do the comparison between the two CMEMs, because the fundamental unit in, in, of the differential expression is different to begin with. And that's also why we resorted to doing rank correlations, because all we are doing is ranking the full change. So we kind of skip the whole issue about outlier values. Yeah, but I mean, it, it might still be very sensitive to these outliers yeah. in the uh, ranking as well. In terms of the re correlations, not, not so much, especially when you look at the distributions where the best performing correlations is at 0 0.5. But yes, it's, it's definitely a, a question worth thinking about. I agree. OK, do we have other questions? Uh, regarding those response, the uh, could you show the slide of the those response? Uh, to, to me, the, the, three, the three micro moral point, uh, for example, Three micro, po uh, three micro, more point uh, looks less variable <laughs> than, than, than micro more. So uh, I mean, I mean the, uh, I'm wondering the, uh, the procedure in the procedure of the CMAP, uh, gym soil concentration is consistent or uh, if the. Um, they diluted with um, just a buffer uh, with the high, highest concentration at, uh, yeah, solution of the drug. The, probably the solution will change depend on the concentration. So yeah, it's kind of <laughs> biased for this kind of, how do you think? Uh. I'm not sure the yeah, procedure. Well, um, I, I definitely tried to make sure that, uh, okay, well, in the C case of CMAP2, um, the controls is basically the population median. So um, that, that, that makes it really hard to say what really is going on here. Um, but I actually have a separate way, a separate pipeline of actually generating full changes from CMAP2 data where I control for making sure the controls are the same. And uh, I, if I remember correctly, I see very similar trends. So um, how to explain the variability, I would say at this point they're probably outliers. Um, but there was actually very recently, like a few days ago, in fact, one of the CMAP2 teams actually tried a reproducibility. Um, they actually published um, where they tried to test for reproducibility between five laboratories. Uh, please don't quote me on this one, but this is kind of what I remember when scheming it, is that they couldn't really explain where the variability is coming from either. So at this point, I, I can't really answer. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> on a related uh, note, when you are really what he has asked you, that yeah. how do you really measure differential expression? Right. One data set, you have one observation, and other one, CMAP2, you have multiple observations. You are just taking the fold change, but you are discarding the variability in the data. Yes, that so is true. So you've got to standardize somehow, and you need to compare apples. You shouldn't compare apples and oranges. It yeah. has to be on the same scale. Otherwise, you are not doing the right justice to the repeated observations. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And uh, I think that's, that's what that's kind of um, tricky about this one because like for the CMAP1 data, mm -hmm. we are working directly with the pre-computed fold changes mm -hmm. in which they do a one-to-one -one comparison. Mm -hmm. I mean, granted, yeah, we could try to redo the experiment uh, by reanalyzing their data from the raw data, which is honestly not trivial because you have to manually annotate all 6,000 samples and perform the whole, co um, the whole differential expression using groups of samples to groups of samples. Mm -hmm. Then in that case, I can compare that against my own pipeline of CMAP2, which I'm, I'm not showing here at all, 
So that, that would be a much better comparison. Um, but yeah, um, so that, that's the thing is that it, it, we are kind of trying to trade off with like things that are already available and we can use. And at the same time, if, if the results were to be very starkly different, it might be hard to justify. Okay, we need to, to, to finish now, but oh, thank you yeah. very much one All more right. time. Thank you.